Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary by W.P. Livingston. Chapter 14 The Aftermath Various incidents came as an aftermath to these happenings. One afternoon, the woman came running to Ma, saying that the elder chief, Ek Pingyong, was bent on having the poison ordeal. When she reached his yard, she found him in fury, shouting and threatening, the women remonstrating, the slaves weeping. It was some time ere she could learn the cause of the uproar. A man from a neighboring village had been about whispering that Ek Pingyong had slain his nephew, in order that his own son might absorb the inheritance. Ek Pingyong was determined to undergo the test, and in accordance with native law, which gave the right to a freedman to call others of equal rank to share the trial with him, he demanded that his brother Edom, who, it was alleged, had instigated the man to make the accusation, should also take the poison. When Mary had grasped the situation, she ridiculed the attitude of the chief, scolded him unmercifully, and at last secured his promise not to carry out his threat. As a result of his good faith, she claimed possession of the Siri beans. He denied that he had any. With the help of his womankind, she made a secret search, and found eleven beans at the bottom of a basket, which she conveyed in the darkness to her hut. As more beans could not be obtained until the morning, she felt that all was well for the night. Shouting, however, made her run back. Mad with drink, the chief was clinging to a bag which the women were endeavoring to seize. He was hitting out at them with his heavy hand, and most of them were pleading. "'There is poison in that bag,' they cried. "'No, Ma, only my palm nuts and cartridges.' Quietly, firmly, persistently, she demanded the bag. He threw it at her. Opening it, she found palm nuts and cartridges. For a moment, she looked foolish. But diving deeper, she pulled out no fewer than forty of the deadly beans. "'I'll take the liberty of keeping these,' she said coolly, but with a swiftly beating heart. "'No, no,' he shouted. His followers joined him in protest. Outwardly calm, she walked between the lines of our men, ironically bidding them take the bag from her. But their hands were held, and she passed safely through, reached her hut, handed the beans to Mr. Ovens, and returned to the scene to pacify the crowd. Next morning she learned to her consternation that Ikpenyen had risen stealthily during the night and gone off on his errand of death. Fortunately, a chief some miles off detained him by force until she arrived. She stuck resolutely to him, and as all the more powerful chiefs came over to her side from sheer admiration of her pluck, he had eventually to abandon his purpose. After taking the native oath, he betook himself to another part of the forest, where he built up a new settlement. One more episode remained to round off the sequence of events. The murderer of a young man in the funeral party was the eldest son of a house noted for bloody deeds, and the act roused the slumbering fury of his neighbors. War was declared and fighting began. Mary interfered and pressed for arbitration, and both sides at last acceded to her request, and asked her to conduct the palavar. Aware that the man was a triple murderer, and the penalty death, she shrank from the duty, and begged them to put the matter into the hands of a Calabar chief. This they did, and went to Ikunitu on the Cross River, where blood for blood was the verdict. Fines and deaths by substitution of slaves were offered and refused. The eldest son, a mere baby, was sent in atonement and rejected. Then the second son, a lad of twenty, was dispatched, and it was agreed that his death would redeem his brother. Mary's distress was acute, especially as she had declined to act as judge, but she was relieved on learning that the prisoner had escaped and was being sheltered by one of the slave traders to cross the river. She wished to get him into her own yard, but the weeping mother said it was too dangerously near home. One morning early she heard the sound of rapid firing, and in alarm she sent messengers to inquire the cause. The lad had been betrayed, brought back, filled with gin, and amidst discharges of guns, beating of drums, singing and dancing, had been strangled and hung in the presence of his mother and sister. These two alone mourned the dead. The others were glad the matter had been so easily settled, and for a week the loafers and drunkards in the district held high carnival. As time passed and the heat of the persecution cooled, Mary made a tentative proposals that Akpo, the escaped chief and his family, should be allowed to return. I will go and fetch them myself, if their safety be guaranteed, she said. Edom, the father of the dead lad, replied, Very well, Ma, you can say that all thought of vengeance is gone from my heart, and if he wishes to come to his own village, or live in your home, or go anywhere in Okiang, he is at liberty to do so. But trust is rare in Africa, 
and suspicion dies hard, and Akpo could not bring himself to believe that Edom wished him well, and he elected to remain where he was. Again she paid the exile a visit, taking with her an elderly man who was betrothed to his daughter. But he could not overcome his fears. In his heart he and his friends were incredulous that the chiefs of Okiang would listen to a woman. A third time the patient Mary went to him, and succeeded in bringing him and his son back with her, the women remaining behind until a new house could be built. The homecoming was full of pathos. House, farm, clothing, seed corn, yams, goats, fowls, all had vanished. But as the chief stood amongst the familiar surroundings, his gloom and silence fell away, and he knelt and clasped on his feet, and with eyes filled with tears vowed that he and his house would be under the yoke to her forever, and that they would never rebel against any command she gave or do anything contrary to her wishes. Most people, white and black, occasionally feel disposed to dispute her rulings, and more than once her will and that of the chief clashed, but he stood to his word, and there was no family in the district who gave her message a more loyal hearing. Edom acted nobly. He not only arranged for the housing of the two men, but gave them a piece of ground and seed for food plants. When she went to tell him all had been done, he simply said, Thank you, Ma. But in the evening he came alone to her, knelt and held her feet, and thanked her again and again for her wonderful love and courage, for her action in forbidding them to take life at his son's death, and for all the peaceful ways which she was introducing. We are all weary of the old customs, he said, but no single person or house among us has power to break them off, because they are part of the Igbo system. And one by one, secretly and unknown to each other, the free people came to her and thanked her gratefully for the state of safety she was bringing about, and charged her to keep a stout heart and to go forward in directions, the end of which was always death. Chapter 15 The Sweet and the Strong Meanwhile, the mission house had evolved into what was in her eyes a thing of beauty. She could at any rate boast that it was the finest dwelling in Okiang, and it was a happy day when she removed upstairs. Nor was the house all that was accomplished during these troublous times. Mr. Goldie had made her a gift of a canoe, but without a boathouse it was exposed to rain and ants and thieves, and she planned a shelter at the beach that would do both for it and for herself. While Emi brought her peoples at the spot, the men cut down trees and erected the framework, and the women dug the mud and filled in the walls, and Mr. Ovens made a door and provided a padlock. Thus, in the course of a short time, she had built a hut, a good house with accommodation for children, servants and visitors, a dispensary, a church, a double-roomed boathouse. All the native labor had been given cheerfully and without idea of money, but from time to time she distributed amongst the workers a few gifts from the mission boxes, or a goat or a bag of rice. In addition to her house at Ekin, she had a room in several of the villages where she put up on her journeys, and it was characteristic of her that she secured these not for her own convenience, but for the sake of the people, in order that they might feel that they were being looked after. It was indeed for the people she lived. Mr. Oven states that she was at their beck and call day and night. She taught in the schools, preached in the church, and as he put it, washed the wee barons herself, and dressed the most loathsome diseases, all with tenderness and gay humor. I never saw a frown on her face, he says. She was always ready for anything and equal to any emergency. One morning, he recalls, she came to me. Twins, she said, and we have to go. When they arrived at the spot, we found the barons had been murdered by the grandmother, and the mother was laying on the bare ground in the hut a distance away. Miss Lesser sent her a bed and pillow and told her husband to be kind to her. The man took her back into the house. Such a thing had never been done before. It was at this time that the plump and pretty infant, referred to by Miss Kingsley in her travels in West Africa, was saved. The mother died a few days after the birth, and as there was a quarrel between her family and that of the father, the child was thrown into the bush by the side of the road leading to the market and lay there for five days and six nights. This particular market is held every ninth day, and on the succeeding market day some women from the village by the side of Miss Lesser's house happened to pass along the path and heard the child feebly crying. They came into Miss Lesser's yard in the evening and sat chatting over the day's shopping, and casually mentioned in the way of conversation that they had heard the child crying, and that it was rather remarkable that it should still be alive. Needless to say, Miss Lesser was off and had that waif home, it was truly in an awful state, but just alive. In a marvelous way it had been left by leopards and snakes, with which this bit of forest abounds. 
and more marvelous still, the driver ants had not scented it. Other ants had considerably eaten into it one way and another. Nose and eyes were swarmed with them and flies. The cartilage of the nose and part of the upper lip had been absolutely eaten into. But in spite of this, she is now one of the prettiest children I have ever seen. The child is not an object of terror like the twin children. It was just thrown away because no one could be bothered to rear it. But when Miss Lesser had had all the trouble of it, the natives had no objection to pet and play with it, calling it the Child of Wonder because of its survival. This child was named Mary after the house mother, and completed the number of those who for long constituted the inner circle of the family. The others were Janie, Alice, a rescued twin of the royal blood, and Annie, the child of a woman who took a native oath to prove that she did not help her husband to eat a stolen dog. These four were to grow up and become a comfort to the white mother, and will reappear from time to time in the course of the story. Another helper in the house at this time was Mana, a faithful girl who had been caught by two men when going home from a spring, and brought to Okiang and sold to Malerni. Other children there were, all with more or less tragic histories, and all were looked after and trained and loved. But Mary could be as stern and strong as her native granite when combating evil. Mr. Oven saw her repeatedly thrust brawny men away from the drink, taking them round the neck and throwing them back to the ground. An intoxicated man, carrying a loaded gun, once came to see her. He ordered him to put the weapon in a corner of the veranda. He declined. She went up, wrested the gun from him, placed it in a corner, and defied him to touch it. He went away and came back every day for a week before she gave it up. Another man came to her for medicine, and after he had described his symptoms, she brought a bottle of castor oil and told him to open his mouth. Fearful that it might be some sort of witchcraft, he demurred. Ma simply gave him a smart box in the ears and repeated the order, whereupon he meekly took the stuff and went ruefully away. About this time also, she went and prevented two tribes from fighting. Although her heart was beating wildly, she stood between them and made each pile their guns on the opposite sides of her, until the heaps were five feet high. On another occasion she stopped and impounded a canoe load of machetes that was going upriver to be used in a war. Mr. Evans was struck by her mental power and wide outlook. But despite her incessant preoccupation with matters about her, she never ceased the cultivation of intellectual interest. She was a loving student of the Bible, a wide and discriminating reader, and she followed with a brooding mind the development of world affairs throughout the world. Before his work was finished, Mr. Evans began to suffer from the exposure, and she nursed him day and night through a serious illness. When he returned to Duketown, she missed his cheerful company. Her isolation and loneliness seemed intensified, and she was only sustained by her faith in the usefulness of prayer and by her communion with the Father. My one great consolation and rest, she wrote, is in prayer. So invariably was she comforted, so invariably was she preserved from harm and hurt, that her reliance upon a higher strength became an instinctive habit. It conquered her natural nervousness and apprehension. She had frequently taken journeys through the forest with the leopards swimming round her. I did not used to believe the story of Daniel in the lion's den, she often said, until I had to take some of these awful marches, and that I knew it was true, and that it was written for my comfort. Many a time I walked alone praying, O oh God of Daniel, shut their mouths, and he did. If she happened to be traveling with bearers or paddlers, she would make them sing and keep them singing. And yet, in some things, she was as timid as a child. When traveling in the mission stream launch, Traveling in the mission stream launch, she would bury her head in her hands and cry out in fear if the engine gave a screech or if the vessel bumped on a sandbank. She was in terror all the time she was on board. It was not possible for her to go on expending so much nervous force without a breakdown, and as attacks of fever were coming with increasing frequency, she began to think of her furlough. The difficulty was to fill her place. In 1890, Mr. Goldie reported that only she or a man could fill it. No native agent could go from Calabar on account of tribal unfriendliness, but she thought otherwise. No person connected with me need to fear to come to Okiang, or suffer from lack of hospitality. Okiang was a very different place from what it had been in 1888. There was a great order and security, and much less drinking among the younger people, many of whom were at school. None dared to use the slightest freedom with her. They might come as far as the veranda, but no further. The people were becoming ashamed of their superstition, and were ready to inform her secretly when palavars and sacrifices were in contemplation. She came voluntarily, and requested her to sit in the seat of judgment and adjure their disputes. 
The tribe as a whole was also working better, developing a regular trade with the Europeans. The problem was solved by another woman with a stout heart, who voluntarily agreed to occupy the station during her absence. This was Miss Dunlop. The home board was anxious as to her safety, and recommended frequent communications with her. A minute later, Miss Hutton, who had just arrived from Scotland, was appointed to keep her company. When Miss Dunlop went up before Ma left, she was met by what she thought was a crowd of peaceful, cheerful people, eager only to greet her and to help her. She modified her opinion later. A wild and lawless class, she called them, boasting of their wildness, who come to the service as drunk. When she spoke of God's love, they would say, Yes, Ma Slusser tells us that plenty of times. But she bravely held the fort. Chapter 16 War in the Gates at the last moment she was busy packing when messengers arrived from a far-off township with intelligence that a young freedman had accidentally shot his hand while hunting, and a request that she would come to him with medicine. She was weak and ill. She was expecting tidings of the steamer. She was beset with visitors from all parts who would come to bid her farewell. Telling them what to do, and asking them to let her know only if serious symptoms set in, she gave them what was needed. Almost immediately came secret news that the man had died, that his brother had wounded one of the chiefs, and that the warriors of the latter had been ordered to prepare for fighting on the morrow. She never knew how this message had come, or who had brought it. She made up her mind to proceed to the spot, but the chief people about her opposed the idea. They pointed to her weakness, and the probability of her missing the steamer. They enlarged on the savage character of those concerned. They owned no authority. They will insult you in their drunken rage. The bush will be full of armed men, and they will fire indiscriminately. The darkness will prevent them recognizing you. But they could not prevail upon her to relinquish what she thought was a duty to those who had sought her aid. She, however, compromised by consenting to take two armed attendants with lanterns, and to call at a chief's place some eight miles distant, and secure a freedman to beat the Igbo drum before her thus letting the people in the fighting area know that a free, protected person was coming. She reached their village about midnight. The chief was reported to be at his farm, and she was urged to lie down till the morning. She suspected that he was not many yards away, and she persuaded a messenger to carry an urgent request to him for an escort and drum. The reply was in the language of diplomacy all the world over. I have heard of no war, but will inquire regarding it in the morning. If, in the event of there being war, you persist in going on, you prove your ignorance to the people, who from all time have been a war-loving people, are not likely to be helped by a woman. This put her on her mettle. In measuring the woman's power, she responded, you have evidently forgotten to take into account the woman's god. She decided to go on. The people were astonished, not so much at her folly in risking her life, as in daring to disobey the despot. Who held their fate in the hollow of his hand. Somewhat chilled by her unsympathetic reception, she started, without much enthusiasm on her journey, but with her faith in God as strong as ever. Reaching the first town belonging to the belligerents, she found it so silent and dark that she began to imagine the chief was right, and she had come on a wild goose chase. She crept quietly up to the house of an old free woman, whose granddaughter had once lived with her. There was a cautious movement within, and a whisper, "'Who's there?' She had barely answered when she was surrounded by a band of armed men, whose dark bodies were like shadows in the night. In a few moments they were joined by scores of others, and the greatest confusion prevailed. She was asked what her business was and who were her informants, but immediately the chiefs permitted her to remain, and the women saw to her comfort. After conferring together, the chiefs thanked her for coming at such discomfort to herself, and promised that no fighting, so far as they were concerned, would take place until she heard the whole story. All the same, they said, we must fight to wipe out the disgrace that has been put on us. See, here are men badly wounded. Now, Ma, go to bed, and we shall wake you at cockcrow, and you can accompany us. This meant an hour's rest, which she urgently needed. At second cockcrow she was called, but before she was steady on her feet they were off, and away down the steep hillside and through the stream at the foot, like a herd of wild goats. The women were at every house. Run, Ma, they cried. Run? Was she not running as fast as her weak and breathless state allowed her? But she soon lost sight of the warriors, and could only fall back upon prayer. A hundred yards from the village of the enemy, she came upon the band in bush, making preparation for attack. 
The war fever was at its height, and the air resounded with wild yells. Walking quietly forward, she addressed them as one would speak to schoolboys, telling them to hold their peace and behave like men and not like fools. Passing on to the village, she encountered a solid wall of armed men. Giving them greeting, she got no reply. The silence was ominous. Twitting them on their perfect manners, she went up to them and was about to force a passage. Then a strange thing happened. From out of the sullen line of dark-skinned warriors there stepped an old man, who came and knelt at her feet. Ma, we thank you for coming. We admit the wounding of the chief, but it was the act of one man, and not the fault of the town. We beg you to use your influence with the injured party in the interest of peace. It was the chief whom she had traveled in the rain to seal and heal when she first came to Okiang. Her act of self-sacrifice and courage had borne fruit after many days. She was so thankful that her impulse was to run back to the opponents in the forest and arrange matters there and then. But she restrained herself, and instead purposely told the men with an air of authority to remain where they were while her wants were attended to. "'I am not going to starve while you fight,' she said. "'And meanwhile you can find a comfortable seat in the bush where I can confer with the two sides. Choose two or three men of good address and good judgment for the purpose.' They obeyed her like children." When the two deputies from the other side came forward, two chiefs laid down their arms, and went and knelt before them, and held their feet, saying it was foolish and unjust to punish the whole district for the action of a drunken boy, begging them to place the matter before the white ma, and expressing their willingness to pay whatever fine might be imposed. She, too, knelt and prayed that arbitration might be substituted for war. So novel a proposal was not agreed to at once. The next few hours witnessed scenes of wild excitement, rising sometimes to frenzy. Bands of men kept advancing from both sides and joining in the palavar, and every arrival increased the indignation and the resolution to abide by the old familiar ways of war. She was well nigh worn out, but her wonderful patience and tact, coupled with her knowledge of all the ins and outs of the character, again won her the victory. It was agreed that a fine should settle the quarrel, and one was imposed which she thought exorbitant in the extreme, but the delinquents accepted it, and promptly paid part in trade gin. Here was another peril. As the boxes were brought forward and put down, the mob began to grow excited at the thought of the drink. She first saw trouble and disaster, but though her voice was now too feeble to be heard in the babel of sound, she was not yet at the end of her resources. Divesting herself of as many of her garments as were possible, she threw them over the stuff, thus giving it the protection of her own body according to equal law. It was a custom for providers of spirits which might have been tampered with on the way from the boat to taste the liquor in order to prove that neither sorcery nor poison had been placed in it, and every man wanted to be the taster on this occasion. As soon as the test had been applied, every man on the other side likewise demanded gin, and for a time it seemed as if all had gone mad. Mary seized the one glass which they held, and as each bottle was open, she dealt out to the older and chief man one glass only, resolutely refusing to give more, and placed the bottle under the cover of her garments. No one dared to touch the stuff. There was some jostling around her, but a few of the men constituted themselves into a bodyguard, and by whip and drum kept the mob off. Amid much tumult and grumblings and laughter at her sallies, she got them to agree to leave the spirit in her charge on her declaring that she would be surety for it, arriving in their village in a good time, and untampered with. She made them promise to go straight home and remain at peace during her furlough, a promise that was loyally kept. But there was one party she was obliged to accompany for a mile or two. They had declared that they were ashamed to return like women without having fought. They begged her to allow them to have a small scrap in order to prove they were not cowards. Not till they were safely past the danger zone did she leave them. She remained till night at the village. The feeling was still too disturbed to permit for a regular service, but she spoke to them quietly of Christ as a Savior, and then ordering all to their rest, she set out, tired as she was, on her lonely tramp through the long miles of forest path. She found her baggage had gone, and that messengers had arrived to take her down to Duke. Chapter 17 Among the Churches Arriving in England in January 1891 with Janie, who provided a great comfort and help, 
she went straight to Topsham to view the graves of her mother and sister. She was anxious to spend as much of her furlough as possible amongst the scenes and with the friends associated with her loved ones, and she secured and furnished a house. It possessed a fine garden, and there, with the little girl, she passed a quiet and restful time until the autumn, when she went to Scotland, making her headquarter at the home of her friend Mrs. McCriddle, now at Joppa. For many months she was engaged on the deputation work which missionaries on furlough undertake for the stimulation of the home congregations. She had less liking than ever for addressing meetings, but she did not shirk the duty. It is a trial to speak, she said, but he has asked me to do, and it is an honor to be allowed to testify for him in any way, and I wish to do it cheerfully. She wanted also to persuade the women in the church to give themselves up more wholeheartedly to Christ, and to consecrate themselves to his cause. No problem was too great if it served that purpose. As a halo of romance was beginning to gather about her, she was in great request. Wherever she went, the interest of the meeting centered in her, and her visits were often followed by the formation of a Zenana Mission Committee. Not always, however, did she satisfy expectations. She would speak freely at the tea table, especially if children were present, and be led on to give vivid pictures of her life in the bush, so that the company would be still sitting, entranced, when the bell rang for the meeting. Then a rush would be made to the hall, where impatient people would be waiting to be thrilled by stories of heroic service, and what they heard was an evangelistic address. The minister would look disappointed, feeling that he could have done as well himself, but she sometimes deprecated surface interest, and said that if the heart was right and the life consecrated, would be supported without any aid. After addressing a meeting at Slatford near Edinburgh, she was on the way to the station when a woman who had been in the audience took Janie and kissed her and pressed some money into her hand. Next day the minister received a letter inscribed, For the lady who gave Janie the money and the kiss on the way to the station, M. M. Slusser. Enclosed was a photograph of Janie in a letter in which she wrote, My dear friend, for such I must call you. Such a true, womanly Christian spirit as you showed yesterday is one of the fruits of our holy Christianity. I thank you for loving and kissing the child. God bless you, my dear sister. I may yet see you in the flesh. I will if I go back to Slateford. But I may be sure of meeting you in the Father's house when the shadows flee away and the everlasting glory has dawned. The recipient kept the photograph and letter and still treasures them as mementos of one of whom she never ceased to think and for whom she always prayed. It was in such ways that she knit hearts to her. She made many friends in the home of the members of the church and greatly increased the interest of her work in Calabar, with the result that after she returned, a larger stream of correspondence and mission boxes began to flow to Okiang. Chapter 18 Love of Lover Aware of her singleness of mind and aim in the service of Christ, and her wholehearted devotion to the interests of the people of Okiang, it came as a surprise to her friends to learn that she was engaged to be married. The hidden romance was disclosed at a meeting of the mission board in September. The suitor for her hand was Mr. Charles W. Morrison, one of the teachers on the mission staff, a young man from Scotland then in his 25th year. His career at home had been a successful one. He had been an active Christian worker, and when he applied to the board for an appointment in Calabar, he was accepted at once and sent out to Duketown. He was a man of fine feeling, with a distinct literary gift. On the few occasions that he had seen Mary, he was attracted by the brilliant, unconventional little woman, and when she was ill, was very attentive and kind to her. Before she left on furlough, they had become engaged on the understanding that he would come and live at Okiang. She made it clear to the board that she had pledged her word to the people not to leave them, and that she would not, even for her personal happiness, break her promise. Mr. Morrison, she believed, would make a very good missionary, and they would be able to relieve each other as she would remain at Okyang when he was at home. The board took time to consider the proposal, and meanwhile Mary received the congratulations of her friends. Her replies indicate that there was no uncertainty in her own mind on the subject. I lay it all in God's hands, and will take from him whatever he sees best for his work in Okiang. My life was laid on his altar for that people long ago, and I would not have one jot or tittle of it back. If it be for his glory and the advantage of his cause, 
there to let another join it, I will be grateful. If not, I will still try to be grateful, as he knows best. Both were a little doubtful as to the action of the board, and Mr. Morrison asked her whether, in the event of a refusal, she would consent to return to Duketown. Such a project, however, she would not entertain. It is out of the question, she explained to her friend. I would never take the idea into consideration. I would not leave my work for such a reason. To leave a field like Okiang without a worker, and go to one of ten or a dozen, where the people have an open Bible of plenty of privilege. It is absurd. If God does not send him up here, then he must do his work, and I must do mine, where we have been placed. If he does not come, I must ask the committee to give me someone, for it is impossible for me to work the station alone. The board seemingly were not sure of the wisdom of the arrangement, and their decision was a qualified refusal. The work which Mr. Morrison was doing at Duketown, they said, was important, and they could not sanction his transference to Okyang until full provision was made for carrying it on effectively and to the satisfaction of the Calabar Committee. When Mary was told the result, she merely said, "With well, Lord Edanes is right, and apparently dismissed the subject from her mind. Mr. Morrison was shortly afterwards compelled to return to Scotland on account of his health. A medical specialist advised him against resuming work in Calabar, and he offered for service in Caferia, but there was no opening in that field, and to the regret and disappointment of the committee, who regarded him as an able and valued worker, he resigned. He went later to America, and was living in a hut among the balsam woods of North Carolina, when a fire took place in which his much-treasured literary papers were consumed. The loss affected him greatly, and hastened his death, which occurred shortly afterwards. Amongst the few treasured books which Mary left at the end were battered copies of Eugene R.M. and sketches by Boss. On the flyleaf of one, in her handwriting, were the letters C.W.M.M.M.S. On the other are signatures in their respective hands, C. Morrison, M. M. Slusser. Love of mother and sister had been lost to her long since, and now love of lover and husband was denied, and again she turned her face alone towards the future. Chapter 19. A Letter and Its Result A sharp attack of influenza, followed by bronchitis, cut short her engagements. During her convalescence, she one day took up the missionary record, and read a letter by the Reverend James Luke, entitled, An Appeal for Lay Missionaries for Old Calabar. Like her own writing, it had a touch of style and originality, and her comment was splendid. But there was one incidental statement with which she did not agree. Mr. Luke called for two more artisan missionaries, not to teach the trade, we have sufficient men for that, even were Calabar ripe for such instruction. As the result of her own observation experience, she had often felt that something ought to be done to develop the industrial capabilities of the natives. The subject had not been lost sight of by the missionaries in the mission board, and the latter had sought by sending out competent artisans to attend not only to the work required in connection with the mission, but to train some of the native youths in the various departments of labor. There had, however, been no attempt to establish the work on organized lines, and the remark which Mr. Luke made induced her to place the whole matter before the church. She penned a long letter, the writing of which so exhausted her that she scarcely knew whether or not the words were rightly spelled. It went to Dr. George Robson, then began his long and honorable editorship of the record, and appeared in the next issue under the signature of one of the Zenana staff. It was a letter which displayed all the qualities of missionary statesmanship was clear, logical, and vigorous in style, and glowed with restrained enthusiasm. She pointed out that it was necessary to help the natives to become an industrial people, as well as to Christianize them, and she combated the idea that they were not capable of being taught trades. Their weak point, no doubt, was their want of staying power, their lack of persistence in the face of difficulties, but this could be counted for by their history. Their own rule and mode of life hitherto had been force of circumstance. The question of training them, however, was too large a problem for the unaided missionary, no longer even, too large even for the mission board. It was a matter for the whole church to take up. Let the science of the evangelization of the nations occupy the attention of our sermons, our congregation, our conferences, and our church literature, and we will soon have more workers, more wealth, more life, as well as new methods. Such an earnest appeal caused some stir in official circles. 
The mission committee took up the subject, and after interviewing the missionaries who were at home at the time, including herself, referred to Calabar for information. As she had no further connection with the matter, the outcome may be briefly noted here. The Calabar committee were favorable to any scheme of industrial training, and the local government also expressed their willingness to assist. After the Rev. Dr. Laws of Livingstonia and the Rev. W. Risk Thompson had gone out and reported on the situation and outlook, the proposal rapidly took shape, and the Hope Waddell Training Institute, thus called after the founder of the mission, came into being, and was soon performing for West Africa the same valuable service that Lovedale and Blythewood were doing for South Africa. She never took any credit for her part in promoting the undertaking, and never made a single reference to it in her letters. She was content to see it realized. Medical advice sent her down to Devon to recruit. She did not complain or worry about the readjustment of her plans. We alter things for the good of our children, she said, and God does the same to us. With Janie, she left for Calabar in February 1892, the Congregational Church at Topsham, bidding her farewell at a public meeting in her honor. <laughs>